welcome everybody to this session this evening promoting positive behavior and managing change uh, managing challenges um with myself becky baxter from down syndrome uk thank you ever so much to twinkle for inviting us to do uh, or working with us to do these um these sessions okay so what we're going to go through um this evening i'm going to have just a very quick touch on the learning profile just to set the scene uh, before we look at strategies to promote positive behavior there's lots we can be doing all of the time to kind of keep things um, going in a positive direction we'll then have a look at identifying some of the functions and the patterns um, and i'll talk a little bit about the need for some time spent on observation before we kind of um, focus on developing a behavior plan and as part of that plan looking at the importance of replacement behaviors um, i'll talk a lot about those um, later on this evening but they're really the, one of the key parts of the behavior plan and um, often get missed so we'll, we'll focus a little bit on those before we talk about kind of managing those social mistakes i've done i've done the wrong thing i've done something that wasn't um expected in this situation and how are we all going to respond to that Okay, so just to quickly touch on the learning profile, we know we have these associated strengths that we see um, in individuals with Down syndrome. So we have um, visual short-term memory links. We're much better at remembering what we've seen and what we've experienced. Um, we have this um, strength in social skills. We're keen to interact generally with others, keen to interact with adults, but particularly keen to um, interact with our friends. Um, and we have good social understanding, kind of can manage um, rules and uh, know how to respond in different activities, um, in different situations. Um, and we're also really good at learning facts. So um, teaching um, whatever it might be from a particular set of guidelines or rules in a particular situation, vocabulary, written words, numbers, what and facts is our kind of um, strength. When we look at associated difficulties, um, we have um, a high incidence of hearing difficulties. So our children are not necessarily hearing all of that verbal input uh, that's going on. Um, and we have difficulties with verbal short term memory. So remembering what it is that we've heard, we might not have heard it accurately in the first place. Difficulties with processing that information. So really, here learning from listening following instructions is a particular challenge for our um, students so even if they listen as hard as they possibly can they are not going to be able to hear and remember and process all of that verbal information that's important to remember when we're thinking about um looking at behavior um we do have difficulties with vision um, so although we have a, a visual short-term memory learn, uh, strength, remembering from what we've seen, we have difficulties with kind of the, the vision and the eye itself. So it's important that we are following any guidance for um, our vision and also that whatever visual supports we use, and again, we're going to talk about those a bit this evening, um, are really clear and accessible um, for our individuals. And then we have the speech language and communication difficulties. So we have difficulties necessarily getting our message across and getting it across clearly. So we've then got this group of individuals who are really socially motivated, really want to be interacting with others, but are struggling in terms of not having the speech and lang speech language and communication skills to support that. So I'll be keeping that in, in kind of mind. Okay, so if we're thinking particularly about managing behaviour, there's a number of evidence-based intervention strategies that are linked with those specific challenges that we see um, associated with Down syndrome. So there are some things that are particularly linked to Down syndrome that kind of increase the likelihood of some of these unwanted behaviours occurring. So um, if we look at the literature, it says that, children, uh, that individuals with Down syndrome um, have a desire to escape the task, um, particularly sensitive to failure. And I would say our children, going back to those social strengths, our children are great at knowing the difference between, um, oh, wow, that was fantastic, and oh, good try. <laughs> and that would be well lead to, oh, I, I want to do this one because I'm really good at this one. Everybody gives me loads of praise when I do this one. This one, I oh, know I'm not so good at. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks very much. So we see this, um, this, desire to escape types or sensitivity to failure come out in the literature which of course may well have an impact on behavior and i'll talk about all of these in a little bit more detail um, we have these impaired communication skills so difficulties with 
um, understanding, maybe um, instructions, and then difficulties with expressing ourselves in other ways. And then there's this idea that um, coming along with this social motivation and social strength is I'd rather be engaging with others. So I could get on with this slightly boring task, or I could interact with you. And actually, that's way more motivating for me. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, I want to just say that, of course, we all know what it's like when we've not slept great, when we're not feeling great. And you just want to kind of have a duvet day. Um, our um, pupils may well be feeling like that for quite a long period of time. I'm pleased to see the sunshine coming out. I'm not sure it is much warmer, but I'm hoping we're coming to the end of those kind of winter months where we've seen um, a lot of, um, of those green noses around. We've seen a lot of infection, a lot of our children being really quite poorly. And of course, that is going to have an impact on um, how you're feeling, on how engaged you are and on your behaviour. But I am going to say from the very beginning, unfortunately, that is not an excuse um, to allow these sorts of unwanted behaviours to occur. You might want to adjust your task. You might want to think, think about your structure of your day, about what you had planned and how you might want to adapt that. If you get a note to come into school in the morning saying, been up since four o'clock this morning, good luck. <laughs> you might think, okay, I might not do my uh, phonics screen this morning, um, but it is certainly not um, okay for these behaviours to be allowed um, to continue. So if we think about this desire to escape tasks, I said about this sensitivity to failure. This is obviously important because if we're not trying things, particularly things that we're not so um, good at, it's going to interfere with our skill development. We've you know, set up these learning tasks for a reason. This is here to help you develop. Um, if you think many of our, our pupils struggle with handwriting and are um, often not keen on having a go at that, um, that handwriting, they know they're not great. We're very good at knowing what we're not, what we're great at and what we're not so good at early on. Um, and of course, if you're not very good at something, you tend to opt out of it. It's not going to be the, the station that you go to. And equally, if you are having a go at doing your writing um, in, let's say, half an hour, those who are good writers are going to get loads of practice. Those who are not such great writers are not going to get so much practice just because of the amount we're going to get down on the page. And we need our children um, to be practicing, um, of course, across all these different um, areas. You may see some kind of cute party tricks, we like to call them, um, coming out. So um, often we might um, have um, got a young person who likes to do a little, quite a young person who likes to do a little song. If I sing this song, everybody thinks I'm great and joins in and does a smile and oh, aren't you, aren't you cute? No, I'm getting out of doing, um, I'm getting out of doing the task. So I want to look out for those kind of, oh, look at me smiling or oh, playing a bit of a joke. Could I, could I do it in the wrong place? What do you think is going to happen? And um, so look out for those kind of cute party tricks. Um, and then, of course, we might have some more of those challenging behaviours. I'll swipe it off the desk. I don't want to do it. I'm um, sinking under the table. Um, there is a question mark about whether um, our pupils have a difficulty in reading others' emotions. Um, I think quite often they know the answer. Quite often you say, oh, how am I feeling cross? Cross? How do you think it makes this person feel sad, sad? I know all the answers. That's not um, why I'm doing it. Um, I'm doing it because you're all talking to me, <laughs> really giving me that in that interaction. But it's worth making, uh, um, keeping that in mind um, and making sure that the students have enough support. I've got a um, secondary school that I've been working with where they've really pushed independence, which is fantastic. And it's, this student has amazing um independence but there's a bit of a balance to be had there between um do they have enough support to understand what the task is and what they need to be doing um and if they're not confident and not feeling sure we might need to put in a little bit more support there so you might want to think about if you think and we get on to why these behaviors might be happening but if it's because they've got this um, trying to escape the task you want to think about is differentiation happening is the task suitable um, to meet the the students needs i know i've been in um to secondary school before and they said oh becky they won't go to um geography refused to go to geography and i said oh what is it about geography don't know don't know and i've been to the lesson and in the first 20 minutes all this student's been asked to do is to um 
write the date and to copy from the board, sat at the back of the room, they can't see the board. Well, I wouldn't want to go. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go to that lesson um, either. So you want to make sure that the differentiation is appropriate so that people can um, access what's going on. They do have an activity and they can do some of that independently as well, not just with somebody keep telling them what to do all the time. Um, you might think that it is OK, but if you've got some of these behaviours and the child is a bit um, unsure, you might want to make it a little bit easier or just start off with an easier, familiar task to get them into the lesson. So feeling a bit confident, know what I'm doing, I've got some success before we um, move on to something a bit um, trickier. So think about having that kind of error lesson. You're going to be successful, you know what you're doing, you look up the answers, but you're working and you're revising and you, you're going over it um, as a starter. You also might want to bring in some of that kind of consequences um, now and next reward motivator type system. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as well in just a bit. Mention these impaired communication systems. So um, we have difficulties with um, receptive language. So hearing, remembering and processing what's being said. So it may well be that I have not understood the um, instruction. So if you've said, oh, um, go, and, go and put your apron on, we're going to do some painting, I may well just hear painting, in which case I haven't put my apron on, not, not because I didn't want to follow your instruction, but it's just too long and complicated and I can't remember it. Um, similarly, I've been um, to a school not that long ago where I've been in a PE lesson and I've stood with the teaching assistant watching this student um, in the input and the teacher is telling the class what to do, talking a lot of the class and we're saying, oh, look, um, he can't follow this information. He is sat there, he listens for quite a long time, and he started to have a little bit of a, uh, a poke at the person next to him, turn around and, and uh, talk to him, let's give him a smile, give him a smile back, yeah. But we can see he's not following what the input is. Um, and then the lesson gets up and he takes himself off in one direction, gets told off by the TA, despite the fact we've just had a conversation where you go, we can clearly see he's not gonna know what to do it's no good then telling them off and not knowing what to do. What we need to do is make sure that he knew what to do and how we can give that input, thinking about visual information, think about taking him off with a partner, acting it out, getting people up there, showing him what to do, getting him up there as part of this partnership. So he knows when I go off, this is what I've got to do. Or that's when the adult support comes in to support that and then steps back once he knows what it is he's got to do. Um, we also have expressive difficulties, so not being able to say or sign or communicate um, what it is we'd like to um, what it is we'd like to say, which may leave us with a lack of appropriate responses. So we can't say, "Oh, can I just have five more minutes? I was just I've nearly finished this level of what have you." Um, what we do have is no, <laughs> no, and um, maybe uh, I'm not moving from here. Um, and the other thing that can happen if you haven't got a lot of language is that or you don't know how to use the language that you've got, thinking about some of my um, secondary school, is that other people may well talk to you less. So rather than coming over and giving you lots of um, opportunities, being scaffolding some of that interaction, asking you some questions, they may think either you don't understand or, or I'm not sure how to interact with that person because they don't come over and talk to me, in which case we then start to get less and less. And it's that sort of time that our pupils are great at finding other ways to get people to come and, um, and talk to them, interact with them. And then finally on the back, on the bottom there, it says about speech clarity and intelligibility issues. So we'll have quite a large number of pupils who are trying to say something, but are not necessarily clear. And of course, um, that can lead to um, misunderstanding. So people saying, oh, yeah, yeah, not sure what they said. Um, and before you know it, he's doing something. He, he tried to ask you if he could do it, but you didn't understand. Or um, maybe getting quite frustrated. So I've really tried to tell you something several times and you haven't got the message. And that is going to be frustrating. And that goes back to what I was saying about um, our pupils really being wanting to communicate, but not having the language to be able to do that. Um, so what we want to think about for um, impaired communication systems is really about teaching, requesting and initiating behaviours. And this could be from reception 
right through um, to college, really. Um, but use of gestures, use of signing for signing, use of pointing to asking and um, to ask, use of pictures. I cannot recommend the use of pictures enough. And that could be for um, a child right down in reception who's got some pictures about um, some favorite TV characters or the things that they like to do um, at the weekend or whatever it might be that they're going to show uh, their friends. And I shall give a few examples of those later on. Um, right up to my, um, let's say, upper primary, where they may have some topic boards on the desk. This is what I might want to talk to my friend about. We're doing the topic of um, Egypt. Here's um, some words about Egypt that I can point to and talk to my friends about. Right up to my secondary, who might be, oh, I've come in with my diary and um, I know to get it out at break time and it, for it will say in there, um, oh, I went to the cinema at the weekend. There's a picture of my cinema ticket. Um, what did you do at the weekend? So you really want to think about having those conversation starters and communication supports um, available right from the very beginning. Um, asking others how to play, how to play at break time um, is really, really important. Teaching the use of questions um, and it might be just can you help? Or it might be, what have you been doing? Or what did you do at the weekend? Are you going to football tonight? What's your favourite lesson? What have you got next? Any of those sort of useful questions that could come up across the week will be worth spending some time making sure that our students know about those. And they can make compliments. Oh, we've got a new jumper. Oh, I'd like your haircut. Those sorts of, listen out for how many of those you've heard and think about um, popping in some communication supports and practice and some visuals um, to support those. Think about some useful vocabulary and phrases. How does the pupil say um, no or I've finished or please stop or I don't want to or I feel cross or I'm a bit worried or actually I'm a bit anxious. I'm a bit nervous. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing in the next lesson. I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be. What do I do in that situation? It's really about thinking um, and this will come up when I say about the observation later on. Think about what it is the student wants to communicate what they could be communicating and really spending some time prompting some of those more appropriate responses when we look at patterns we're going to think oh yeah it always happens at carpet time always happens at break time it always often um, happens either at verbal input times so at carpet times beginning of the lesson time when there's a lot of talking and the students can't follow on or it often happens at those unstructured times um, moving between lessons or going out to get your coat or break time um, and if you know when it's going to happen that's when you can go oh where's your communication support let's get that out let's get that um, up and running before you even get into that situation and obviously we want to see a reduction in that requesting attention through the use of challenging behavior and using some of these more um, suitable systems so there's examples of conversation supports they've got your space vocabulary maps you'd have that about your topic whatever the topic is on the desk and I know to point to that, my friend will talk to me about that, or I can say, what's that? And they can tell me about that. Um, and that could be from any any kind of curriculum age. There's an example of a conversation diary for a younger one there that I am playing football. So you just have some photos in there and some sentences. There's an example of an older one there, my favorite team is, um, and having some related questions and pictures about the latest movie. Or well, that one there on the um, left is about somebody who had a new puppy. So what can I say? What can I ask? It's just some vocabulary prompts, some question prompts, because um, otherwise they're not going to come in and say, oh, guess what? I've got a new puppy without that visual reminder, or they may well not. Um, and then finally, we've got this enhanced social motivation. So from very young, we may see um, children trying to opt out of task in favour of social interaction. And that could be through, through diverting attention. Some of it may come back to the, a bit similar to we saw in the first example when we were thinking about um, sensitivity to failure. You might see some of those cute party tricks, but this time it's about because I'd rather get your attention rather than it is about um, the task. Some of our students are great at asking the same question over and over again, even when they know the answer. I found myself doing it. Um, Oh, my middle name is, we're not talking about middle names, we're talking. <laughs> I've got these, these questions that people like to respond to and I can bring them out. Um, nice conversation starter, but not necessarily at the right time. Um, you may also have some of those um, more negative behaviours or those that we see um, as negative, which again, um, we might think, well, this isn't a nice time for you, moving you down the board or you're being um, told off or what have you. 
but actually you are talking to me again now and that was better than me not being talked to by anybody and actually what we often see is that somebody comes over and tells you when you're doing the wrong thing but then gets you back on the right track and so if you're not careful the students start to learn if I'm not sure what to do I can do this and somebody will come over and sort it out for example um, I go out of playtime and I push somebody and somebody comes over and says, oh, I mustn't push, must what do you want to play? You want to play um, hopscotch? Let's go in our so zone. And before I know it, I've just learned, huh. So when I come out to play, if I want to play hopscotch, the thing I need to do is push that, push somebody, and they'll come over and sort that out for me. So I want to look at um, not reinforcing some of these things as well. Um, or it might be seeking alternative positive attention. Look at me, look at what I can do. This is great, but it's not the thing that I've asked you to do. Oh, I'm great at running around and picking up all the coats. Well, yeah, very good, but you're supposed to be in lesson learning <laughs> at the moment. Um, so those three things are kind of the key or the most common um, links to in behavior to, um, to individuals with Down syndrome. And we can see these behaviors really emerging very young at preschool, and if not addressed, may well continue. And it's a very serious issue because um, I would say behaviour is the biggest barrier to inclusion. It's not about ability. Some of our um, less able pupils who are able to be in the classroom, get on with their working, not disrupting, don't have any problem in terms of their um, placement. It's maybe some of the more able students where they are disrupting the rest of the class, they're disrupting learning, where we're seeing um, the placement be put more at risk. So it is a, it's obviously a serious issue and one that we'd want to get sorted out early on. Um, so thinking about the support for interaction with peers, break at lunch times, I said often these unstructured um, times can be um, a time that some of these behaviours most commonly occur. You want to think about providing equipment, so active games that rely less on language, things like basketball, football, tennis, could be hopscotch, could be art clubs, so take out some pencils, doesn't necessarily have to be active as in physically active, but it's about doing, taking turns. I know the game, I know what to do, and not about talking too much. It might be playground games, um, particularly at primary school. It might be about those communication supports, particularly as you get a bit older, taking out a magazine to look at with your friends that they're interested in as well. Um, but I've got that visual that's going to, oh, can I show you my magazine? Yeah, let's have a look through. You can tell me bits about it. I'll name the... Um, pop stars I know, not that I know many <laughs> current ones anymore. Um, doing a bit of role play and acting out before they're in those situations, so they know exactly how to use these things, they know what they're doing. You might want to develop a bit of a circle of friends, so you have a group of friends who know about these communication supports, they know how to um, scaffold that interaction. Um, the group of friends that I, I spend most of my time with, that I'm most friendly with, might want to do a bit of work so that we know that they know how to um, support anti and what communication um, support should be around. I'd always say include more than one child in an activity, sometimes in whatever it is, because it's great to have somebody to model the activity so our child is seeing it, but also it shows some of the other children what our children can do in terms of their understanding because they may well have thought they couldn't because they weren't saying a lot um, and sometimes I come across particularly as we get to kind of later primary and certainly into secondary um, the idea that they say oh Becky we're going to come out and do some work on social skills and I'll always say oh great who are they coming out with oh no they're coming out on their own oh have we thought about this <laughs> really you might have to do a little bit of work practicing first but really if we're working on social skills we need to think about when are we going to be implementing those and then just about making activities fun so it's fun for everybody to do. It's not necessarily about our um, pupil with Down syndrome. There's a fun activity going on and everybody wants to join in. And it's a, one that's suitable for our pupil with Down syndrome. I've been, I've had um, board game club or taking out um, the wet play box at break time. I've had friendship bracelet club, nail varnish club, whatever it might be. But there's an activity going on that people want to get involved in that's um, at an appropriate level that we can equally join in without having to have that additional support all of the time and um, these are just some examples of supporting interaction with peers a couple of which i've mentioned so having question prompts and that could be anything from can i have a look at your work to um what's your favorite amazon creature <laughs> to um what's 
can I ask you a question about this GCSE science? It could be absolutely anything. I've got my target vocabulary, I've got my definitions. I can take a question from the prompt and ask it to my friends. It could be about something that I'm interested in or a relevant topic that everybody's interested in. And I've got those sometimes maybe in class, depending on the class, depending on the time, but I'm, I know when I can get those out. Vocabulary board, social survey, going around and asking um, other students, it might be about the class topic, it might be that you're doing, um, a bit of a voting system. I'm going to go around and ask um, some questions. I'm going to ask what's your answer to number three. Could be anything. Um, showing your work to others and looking at others' work. Can I have a look at your work? Can I get some ideas? Can I show you my work? Um, and having a responsibility in class. And last month, I did a session all about supporting um, friendships and communication with others. And if you didn't have a chance to see that session um, and you are having some of these behaviours, I would really go... Um, recommend going back and having a look at the supports for it supporting interaction with peers because if we could get this right we'd have much less of some of those unwanted behaviors okay we want to have a think about the um function behaviors serve a function always serve a function we might not be able to see what it is always but we want to have a look at why they are happening and then that's going to inform our replacement behavior which i'm coming on to in just a second so if we see oh it happens when nobody's talking to them it gets somebody to talk to me if it's um it might be oh it always happens um in a particular lesson as i said earlier have a look at that lesson why is that why is that happening whatever happens after the behavior will often lead to a reduction or an increase in the behavior or i can either reinforce that behavior oh look you knocked all the stuff off the shelf here over i come running make a big fuss that probably is going to reinforce it that I might do it again tomorrow. Oh, look, huh, they all came over and spoke to me. Hang on a second. Yeah, yeah, I've done it again. Um, not necessarily trying to be tricky, but in a, oh, I've learned a communication strategy. It's not the best one, but it works perfectly well. Um, I knock this off. They all come over and talk to me. I go under the table. They all try and um, uh, get me out. I start shouting. They all then um, respond to me. Equally, if you are reinforcing positive behavior oh you are doing amazing writing oh thank you for helping me with the books oh brilliant holding the door whatever it might be you're then starting to reinforce some of those um, more positive behaviors um not all behaviors go on to be problematic of course they don't Every, all um all children demonstrate some of these um behaviors um, and you may need to do some observation and record keeping if you're not sure about the function and then people will often say oh, it comes out of nowhere I'll be questioning that and I would be saying, have you really done some observation of this of the pupil at a, at a variety of different times? If you know when a behavior occurs, obviously great time to do an observation. But even if you're now thinking, well, I haven't got too many of those behaviors, it's worth spending some time observing the pupil in different settings. So in the classroom when they're working on their own out in the playground when they're um, out at playtime or lunchtime in the canteen or the lunch hall and just see what's working well and when you think if you see things that are working well brilliant reinforce them if you see opportunities that are missed think about what targets and supports you could be putting in but also if you see things going wrong think about what could they be doing instead what are they missing what do we need to teach them to do um, so it's worth doing some observation and if you've got some of these behaviors then it's worth obviously doing um, an a b c chart so here's an example of um, an observation or so these are from different students they're just on here as an example um this is was from a younger pupil so just looking at interest at two people talking well it could have come out of nowhere or it could be like i want to interact with you i want to interact with you i want to interact with you and if you don't give them some way of interacting then they're going to find some way of going over and interacting themselves. So I want to think about what could they be um, wanting to do, join in. Um, we want to introduce some new visuals um, so they can then share that they know, and we teach them to go over and how to use that. This was a secondary school example. I went to the school and they said, oh, Becky, and then the students stealing. I said, oh, oh, are they? Yes, yes. Um, and I watched them go into class and they go past somebody's desk and they take their pen. Um, and actually what they want, if you stand back and watch, is they want somebody to turn around and say, hey, that's my pen. And then they go, oh, here you go, sorry about that. What's happening? What's the function? Ha, huh. 
they're starting a conversation. So much so that if the pupil doesn't notice, um, this young um, student would turn around and say, I've got your pen. <laughs> come on, talk to me. Um, so we can see and start to see why some of these behaviours um, are happening. This was a secondary school example as well, actually. Um, at break time, student sits with friends and gets their joke cards out. This was a student who for a long time had sat on their own or with an adult. And I'd kept saying, oh, look, they're with the adult again. They're talking to the adult again. And adults are great. Adults provide all of the support. They don't make you ask what they did at the weekend. In fact, they don't want to tell you. They just ask questions of you and they um, lead conversation, which is, makes life easy. Um, and I'd said to them, look, we need to work on friendships, we need to support and interactions. Um, and I finally went back and I observed a great break time of this pupil um, with other friends, sharing their joke cards, reading them out to each other. And I said, oh, um, what do you think made the difference? And they said, we took the adult support away, we stepped back. And that we didn't necessarily disappear, but we didn't have ourselves there being that person that could be talked to. Because some of our students, by the time they get there up to secondary school, we've got some great um, questions to ask adults and to engage adults in conversation. And the bottom one there, it just says takes themselves off and sits alone. And I think we've talked a bit about the importance of supporting that interaction and putting those supports in place if they want to use them. But there's also, and it's important that we give the students opportunity to know what that activity is, know how that communication support works before they opt in or opt out of using it. Um, but equally, these things are hard work. And if you've worked hard all morning, you might just need a bit of a break. Um, so it's also just thinking about, um, sometimes it's all right if I just need a bit of, uh, a bit of downtime. Um, here we have ABC chart. So um, on here we record the antecedent, what happened just before the behaviour. I would imagine most schools will know about these. The behaviour itself, what happened, and then um, the consequences, what happened afterwards for um, the student. Um, most information needs to go in this antecedent column. I need to know exactly what happened in the situation, who was there, what time it was, how long the activity had been going on for, what was the activity, because that's going to start to give me um, the patterns. The behaviour um, really is minimal. I might say took something, knocked something on the floor, pulled somebody's hair, whatever it might be. And then you have, might have a bit of information in terms of the consequences strategy. So this example um, comes from a French lesson year two um, and I arrived, it was me, um, obviously, I arrived at the um, lesson to see this pupil working very nicely actually with a peer, not with adult support, adult support had stepped away um, and the whole class had had um, an activity and it was a tricky activity I would say for quite a few of the students in there but um, they had a list of the months of the year, uh, word cards with the months of the year in um, French and a set in English. And the activity was that the students had to, one, one of the children had um, the French ones and one had the English ones. And it was like a matching pairs game. Turn them over. Are, do they, are they a pair? Um, and if they were, brilliant. What happened was um, the um, peer chose their card and then um, the people that I had gone to see um, chose their card. And the peer said, oh, they're a pair. And my student said, um, no, no. I said, yeah, yeah, they're the same. They said, no, no. And they didn't want to give them to their friend um, because they're not the same. So the child took them and put them under their under their um, bottom, under their lap. So then the pupil said, hey, you must be able to teach. Uh, TA comes over. She says, God, she's taking the cards. What are you doing taking the cards? Look, yes, yeah, they're the same. On to the next one. So what happens to the next one? Here chooses a card. My pupil chooses the card, they're the same. They're the same. She's absolutely right. They're not the same. <laughs> they're not. She's used to word matching. These words are not the same. And she's told you they're not the same. And she's going to do everything she can. Um, but if you're not watching, it's very easy to think, oh, look, she's messing around and putting the cards, taking the cards. What we actually did was we just put the same colour dot on each of the pairs. And then she was quite happy. And the same colour? Oh, yeah, they're, they're a pair. They're a pair. That's fine. Um, but it was about communicating what she wasn't able to communicate, what the problem was with the um, with the activity. Um, this example is uh, from a year six pupil. They were in um, an RE art lesson. Um, 
been the class had been given uh, instructions and he had been given very clear instructions on what to do so he'd written it on a whiteboard so he knew he didn't have to remember he could look back he could read what he was doing he had a bit of a motivator there so he was collecting his visual um ticks and he had to get 10 ticks and then he was getting his motivator his three ticks on the board and it's all going well it was about doing a bit of art a bit of painting um and the teaching assistant comes over and says, oh, how are you getting on? Oh, that's too much water on there. You need to get some of that off. And what happens? The child swears at him. We're doing the observation. We know this is a common thing that happens. Well, you've just come over and told me my work's rubbish. I probably am going to swear at you, to, to be honest. Um, so the TA, what happens? The TA raises his voice. No, we don't do that. Don't swear. What happens? The child swears again. Um, at the meantime, in the meantime, um, friends are looking around and kind of giving you know, a bit of a snigger and a bit of a smile. And so he goes back to doing his work. He looks over at his friend. His friend looks over at him, smiles at his friend. Friend goes on working, looks around, and then he swears loudly and smiles at his friend. Because he thinks, he thinks that's great. And he kind of did. You know, he laughed along. It was a great. What does that say to me? One, I need to do a bit of work with the TA in terms of accepting levels of work. And um, two, this student looked over and wanted to talk to his friend. How does he do that? What questions can he ask him? What supports does he need in, in terms of doing that? So it really is worth keeping some detailed records and having a look at them for any patterns um, that you start that start to emerge in when it's happening. Because can you change the situation, um, why it's happening? Um, and also, what do we want to be seeing happen instead? What does the student want to be doing? So once you've got kind of a bit of a, an idea of your of your patterns of behaviour, you want to think about developing your behaviour plan. So identify the behaviour. I would always say start with one behaviour. You might have a few going on and it might be that whatever you decide to do works for a few. But if you're really going to measure properly, you want to set yourself one to start with. Have a look at your ABC. Are there any patterns? It might be you need to spend a bit more time doing those. It might be you need to ask people to gather a bit more specific information in there but they're generally patterns jump out at you quite quickly um, then think about can you prevent the behavior from happening um, what's your replacement behavior and i'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail before we then move on to what you do when unwanted behaviors occur and that's what everybody wants to know people kind of come to these sorts of sessions for number six what do i do when these unwanted behaviors occur but actually if you look at the first part you might never get to those sorts of behaviours. And we will certainly cover tonight um, what, to, what I would suggest you do when unwanted behaviours occur, but that's only a very small part of it. What you want to think about is what you could have done before it happened in the first place that's going to change that behaviour on a day-to-day -day basis. How are you going to ensure everybody's on board? Of course, you want everybody to be being consistent. And how are you going to measure success? So look at your patterns, as I said, listening, input, carpet times, often a pattern, break, lunch times, transition between lessons, whether it be just going out um, uh, between getting uh, home time or coming in the morning or between break time or moving around school and um, finding your way to the next lesson, busy corridors, often those sorts of times that we think, oh, they're going out to break. It's going to be lovely. They'll be all right out there. Actually, that's often some of the most difficult times. How do I go out there and get myself in a game the other thing that happens quite often is people say oh it's always in the afternoons it's always in the afternoons when they're a bit tired and then if that's the case i would very seriously look at what happens in the morning because often our students are worked really 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 hard in the morning they have somebody with them a lot talking at them a lot and if you think oh um I'm not very good at hearing, remembering and processing what you've said. Me trying to follow what you said all morning and you telling me to get on with my work all morning. Um, I am going to be worn out in the afternoon. We need to look at a bit of a balance of the of the morning sessions. I did a session actually um, earlier in the week, not on behaviour, it was actually on, on uh, number. But I said at half past two, right, this is your last activity. And I bet you're all feeling now, oh, God, worn out. That's how my child will be in half past two um, every day. I want to be thinking about, oh, just giving that bit of downtime throughout the day, some independent tasks and things that, that are a vision that aren't me having to really work very, very hard all the time.
You might see that you've got some patterns in terms of it's a particular person. It always happens with this particular teaching assistant, lunchtime supervisor sometimes um, haven't had as much training or as much information. It's not about um, uh, saying that person's doing the wrong thing. You know, it just identifies that person as needing a bit more training and a bit more support and a bit of shadowing of other people and how do they manage and what are they doing um, uh, differently. And it may be with particular students. And again, you might need to think about doing a bit of work on what's different about that student or that inter interaction. And we might need to do some support for those pupils, thinking about might be the group of friends, but also it might be thinking about um, more generally in terms of uh, peer education for the class, what's, what's useful for the year group. It might be that there's a particular need not being met, often a communication need, um, and think about when does it happen? Because if you can, if you know when it's going to happen, it always happens at the beginning of that lesson. It always happens in that activity. It always happens in PE. We know when it's going to happen. We can, of course, get in there before um, it does in terms of our changes. Um, so can you avoid the place, the person, the situation? You might not always be able to. You might go, actually, this per it's not working with this person. We need to change change it up. Um, it might be that that's not per possible. And so um, we need to then, of course, put in some training. But when you're putting in that training, no, it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen immediately. Whereas if we change that person, it might be. Similarly, if it's a, a, um, a, particular, uh, a particular place that it happens, if it always happens, I don't know, in PE, actually, could we not go to PE for the next two weeks while we work on teaching a new skill and a new what happens in PE time and then going back in when we're ready to be um, successful. Just some other strategies on there, preparing and teaching for new environments, making sure that pupils know what they're expected to do before they get to a new situation. I mean, um, my prime example of that is um, swimming. If you've got a student who's kind of junior school and um, they go swimming with their with their parents and they get, love swimming, they go swimming, it's a splash pool, they get out of the pool, they jump in the pool, they get out of the pool, they jump in the pool, they go under the water, they go fish those toys, they throw their toys, go after them. It's brilliant. I love swimming. And school say, oh, so after half term, we're going to go swimming. They're going to think, oh, swimming. I love swimming. I just get out of the pool, jump in the pool, jump in the pool, jump in the pool. Um, if it's if it's a new situation you want to think about and this is what school swimming looks like so before they even get there and make the mistake you've taught them what you want them to do think about the language that you use um that's about um asking versus telling um, children. I think sometimes we're all very British, aren't we? We'll say, oh, do you want to uh, read your book to me? Do you want to go to the toilet? We don't mean that. We mean now is the time to. Um, so make sure that if you're, if you're not, if the answer can't be no, <laughs> don't ask. <laughs> Try and use that bossy but fun and be positive and tell them what's happening and offer a choice whenever you can in the instruction. Um, Giving choices is really powerful in terms of giving our students an opportunity for communication. We're going to do some writing. Do you want to use this pen or this pen? We're doing writing, not asking if you want to do some writing. We're doing writing, but the choice is you can make this choice. And now I'm giving you a bit of time. Hmm, I'm going to choose that one, even if I can't necessarily say those words. Oh, that is a great idea. I thought we'd use the black one as well. Moving on. Um, talked about knowing what to do, giving clear instructions. It might be worth thinking about having some class rules, having those, this is what happens when I come into school, this is what I do before I go into um, the new year in September. What's going to be different about it? Do I go in a different door? Is it a different teacher? Do I put my coat in a different place? If somebody spent some time teaching me that with some visuals, I'll be less likely to make mistakes in the first place. Um, having a visual timetable, being able to read a planner, again before I get to secondary so I'm ready to go I know how this works before I've got to spend half a term going wrong and people talking to me about going wrong I'm in the wrong place again oh, I should be in this lesson um <laughs> making sure we know what we're supposed to be doing personal but social stories that they're all about us that tell us about these sorts of situations teaching those routines 
this is what happens maybe having a list of tick jobs to, to tick off so i know what i should be doing um, and i've talked about those new environments and making sure that we're planning inclusion in all school, school activities i mentioned lunch time sometimes being tricky having those clubs that bit of structure making sure we're involved um, in opportunities for after school clubs school trips residential trips um, school holidays so when you can try and avoid those mistakes having clear independent tasks and that might include what we might call soft tasks so they are things that the student can easily do competently um, on their own or it doesn't matter if they get it wrong the idea is they are working at their level as best they can um, without some adult support and you're going to measure that success not necessarily by the answers but by are they there are they getting on i have a quick chat with my friend but i'm certainly um, able to get on without that level of input having responsibilities helping others encourage them to watch others oh what's that person doing what do you think you, sh you, sh you could be doing lists of jobs i've mentioned particularly helpful for remembering and for our readers particularly um, as we move through school having some written instructions to follow that we can look back on that we don't have to remember is important um, in terms of replacement behavior we need to think about teaching them what else it is we want to do so we've got an unwanted behavior you've got to replace it with a wanted one and it might be something um uh, well it's definitely going to be something alternative but it might be completely different and it might not be um it, uh, it might, well, it says and they might not be related, so it's not a reminder. So if you've got somebody who's um, pinching, you wouldn't have don't pinch. Or if you've got somebody spitting, I've seen an example of a social story where it says don't spit in it. Don't, don't, don't go into <laughs> what you don't want them to do. You want them to be something not remind that you're not going to remind them of. Um, it's really hard to be sat with nothing. So if you say, well, you're not going to knock these things off the table. Um, I might try, I might try, but if you don't give me something else, I might go for a little bit longer, but it is still likely to happen. And there's just a note on there to say about gentle hands. We do see sometimes, particularly um, in the infants, maybe some hair pulling or a bit of pushing or a bit of um, grabbing. Particularly, I, mean, I can't talk to you, I want to get your attention. There you are. You can understand why. If you've got that, I would avoid um, what we call gentle hands, being gentle. Um, one is, um, I don't think many children understand what gentle hands are. Um, I'm not sure I understand what gentle hands are really. Um, lots of moisturizer maybe. But um, what we don't want, if you've got somebody who's a grabber, you don't really want to encourage them to be really close. Um, because while well, I'm here, doing a bit of stroking, here we go still not really moving me on to anything else is it they're not really reacting um i haven't moved on to a game or to ask a question or to show them something so i've still only got that um to do and also we don't generally go around stroking each other <laughs> so i would be looking for what's a replacement behavior that's kind of more age appropriate so have a look around at what the rest of the, the students are doing replacement behavior is for the pupil so what we want the pupil to do instead um, adults may well be going to do something different but this is particularly thinking about the student um, and we want to be really specific so we want to say rather than say oh they're going to express when they've had enough when they've, when they've finished i want to know how are they going to sign finished are they going to put their hand up are they going to hold up a finished card because i need everybody to be reinforcing that exact um, thing and then spend some time teaching that new behavior Okay, this is the bit that everybody wants to know. Um, what are you going to do when unwanted behaviour occurs? Firstly, I would say you do whatever you would normally do in your um, your school, which might work absolutely fine. Um, if this hasn't worked or doesn't work, um, these are the steps I would recommend. So um, we know that looking back at what we've talked about tonight, our students are incredibly socially motivated. So what you want to do is not give them that social reinforcement. So you really don't want to be giving them eye contact. You don't want to be talking to them about it. You really want to be withdrawing your attention. You may need to move away. You may need to move others away. Um, you want to put your attention on what it is you want them to be doing. So if you've got some, if let's say um, you want them to be doing writing and they're refusing, you're gonna, you're not gonna go. Oh, yes, yeah, gotta do your writing because then it's. Oh, but if you do your writing, then I get. Wow, I'll get you the iPad. 
oh no, it's just getting more and more input and more and more exciting. We don't want to be reinforcing that. Um, I'm going to go give my attention to somebody else and say, oh, you are doing amazing writing. Let me get you one of my special stickers or whatever it might be. Um, then you offer the pupil the opportunity to come back and do the appropriate behaviour. Can you do some lovely writing? And if they say yes, brilliant, you're going to reward them as soon as you can. Um, and if they say no, you're going to give it back to giving your attention um, to somebody else. Um, and I would say you offer that two or three times. If they join in, fantastic. If they don't, then you pack up, move on to the next thing, knowing um, that they didn't get your attention. You haven't reinforced it. I'm going to say a little bit more about rewards and uh, just a second. Um, I've gone there. Avoid that discussion. Avoid, oh, how does it make so-and-so feel? And Because you're feeding into that. We talk a lot about this behaviour. We remind you about this behaviour. Again, similarly for saying sorry, um, lots of schools think that that's very important. And again, it's a discussion for you to have in your school. Um, what I tend to see is the students either say, sorry, 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 sorry. It means nothing. Um, it certainly doesn't stop the behaviour. Or they'll say, no. So, oh, you must say sorry. No. Well, if you don't say sorry, well, you're talking to me and talking to me and talking to me and my friends here as well. So brilliant. And I think, is it, um, do we want them to be saying sorry 20 times a day or do we want to stop the behaviour? Um, give clear, short instructions, offer choices when you can, make sure you follow through and are consistent. Um, use tone of voice and facial expression. So if you mean no, not don't do that, we don't want to go, oh, you know, I don't like it when you do that. Because if I don't understand language, oh, that looks like you do. So we really want to be very clear about that. Um, and think about what the class school reward sanction system is. Um, does it need uh, adapting? And it may well do. Um, how are we going to measure success? Obviously, it's important. You'll have your ABC log. So you want to record... Um, the frequency of the unwanted behaviour, but also you want to be recording the frequency of your replacement behaviour. So you want to see a decrease, obviously, in that unwanted behaviour, but we want to see an increase in that replacement behaviour. And if you're not seeing that, you really need to look at your replacement behaviour and review it. Because if it's not happening, we need to know why. Has it not been taught enough or does it need to be changed for something else? And I've just put on there, be prepared for things to get worse initially. Because if I've done something and you've all come running, and this time you didn't, chances are I'm going to go, oh, you must have missed that. Hang on just one second. I'll try it. I'll try it again. So they have notice, which is good. And that's when you've got to get in with your what's my replacement behavior. Think about your um, the bad news book or the end of the day. If you're recording that unwanted behavior, you want the positives in there as well. And um, think about how you're sharing that with parents. I would avoid discussion in front of other parents and other children. And I would avoid any discussion in front of the pupil. If it happens in the morning, it's done. If they're back on the right track, we don't want to be reminding them of what we don't want them to do. And what is it we expect parents to do? Or if it's coming in from parents in the morning, what is it we want school to do? It should have been dealt with um, at the time. Oh, felt like that was a lot to get through then. Um, this is just to say that we have um, launched a new behaviour support service, which is going through this with individual schools in a bit more detail. So if you are seeing some behaviours, hopefully you've got some, lots of ideas from this evening to go away with, have a go at. But if you feel like, oh, I need a bit more, maybe in a few weeks, I'm not, not sure about the replacement, I'm not sure about the prevention, then I just wanted to share that with you. Oh, thank you very much.